As the world shifts towards a multipolar system, we are witnessing increasing resistance to Western dominance and a decline in American influence over countries and social movements. Countries are finding leverage in balancing relations with superpowers such as the United States, the EU, Russia, and China. While it is difficult to pinpoint the exact moment when the transition to multipolarity began, certain global events have accelerated this shift. The 2014 US-sponsored Maidan coup in Kiev and the instrumentalization of the Ukrainian people have made countries more cautious in their dealings with the United States, seeking to avoid a similar fate. This is particularly evident in Georgia, a South Caucasus country that held parliamentary elections on October 26, 2024. The ruling party, Georgian Dream, won a decisive 53.94% of the popular vote, marking a defining moment in the country's history. On October the 27th, a day after the elections, several Western countries, including Germany, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Ireland, Ukraine, Poland, and of course Canada, urged the European Union not to recognize the election results. In contrast, China and Georgia's neighbors, Turkey, Russia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, congratulated Iraqi Kobachidze on his party's victory. In this report, I'll be interviewing Georgian academics, politicians, and union organizers to better understand the politics behind this election. I will also share with you guys footage that I was able to record before, during, and after the elections. These elections are crucial within the broader context of Western ambitions to open a second front against Russia along Georgia's borders. They also reflect the ongoing successes and failures of Western interference in foreign nations. As the geopolitical status quo shifts, these elections highlight global trends. Just before arriving in Georgia, I was in Moldova, where an EU membership referendum passed by a razor-thin margin of 0.35 points, largely due to diaspora votes from the EU. Georgia, a nation of just under 4 million people, speaks a unique Kartvelian language with little influence from any other regional languages. It boasts a thriving cultural heritage, including a winemaking tradition that spans over 8,000 years. Throughout history, Georgia has survived by preserving its identity despite the presence of powerful empires in the region. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 ushered Georgia into a new chapter of its history, starting with a civil war that lasted until 1993. The conflict ended with the declaration of independence by South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Although their statehood remains largely unrecognized by the international community, the decade following the civil war was marked by political unrest. In 2003, amid the wave of Western-backed color revolutions in post-communist countries, Georgia underwent the Rose Revolution, driven by widespread distrust in the 2003 election results. This revolution brought Mikhail Saakashvili to prominence, and he governed Georgia from 2005 until his downfall in 2013. Saakashvili's tenure was characterized by rapid privatization, rising economic inequality, repression of opposition politicians, and widespread corruption. In 2008, three years into his rule, Georgia attempted to regain control over South Ossetia and Abkhazia by invading the South Ossetian capital of Tsinvali. Russia intervened, pushing Georgian forces out of both regions and advancing as far as Gori, just 70 kilometers from Tbilisi, the capital. The war resulted in a shift in Georgian-Russia relations, cutting off diplomatic ties between the two nations. To this day, diplomatic and consular services are managed through interest sections within the Swiss embassies as neither country hosts an embassy for the other. In 2012, Saakashvili's government was ousted in popular elections, and since then, Georgian Dream has governed the country with a technocratic pro-business platform balancing relations with regional and global powers to maintain stability. Saakashvili, facing charges for crimes committed during his time in office, fled to Ukraine where he acquired Ukraine citizenship and held government positions including the role of governor of Odessa. The first time I visited Tbilisi, Georgia was on the 1st of October 2021, the same day Saakashvili returned from exile, hiding in a truck container to enter the country legally. His goal was to rally support for local elections taking place that month. Large protests were held in Liberty Square in the heart of Tbilisi, demanding his release. More recently, Georgian Dream has faced significant challenges, including implementing the foreign agent law and managing tensions with Salome Surabishvili, a French-born politician appointed as president by the Georgian parliament. 
Although Zura Bishri was initially aligned with Georgian Dream, she has since distanced herself from the party and advocated for increased Western influence, undermining the ruling government. I was also in Georgia in early 2024 when the government passed the Foreign Agent Law, intended to increase financial transparency regarding the foreign funding of NGOs to safeguard Georgian sovereignty. While the opposition and Western countries labeled it the Russian law, similar laws exist in EU countries, Canada, and the United States. To provide further context for the elections and deeper understanding of Georgia's history, I spoke with Brian Gigantino, a lecturer and researcher specializing in the history of the Caucasus region. He also co-hosts the podcast Reimagining Soviet Georgia. The interview was recorded on the 25th of October, 2024. Georgia during the Soviet period was called the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic. It was one of the wealthiest, kind of most privileged republics in the whole Soviet Union um, for a number of reasons. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, Georgia became the, had the harshest decline of any um, right. uh, post-Soviet state. Now, there were some like Tajikistan that had been poor and had civil war, and it was also incredibly bad. Obviously, Russia, Ukraine, everywhere had problems. But Georgia saw the star starkest decline, harsh rates of deindustrialization. Georgia had a huge professional class during the Soviet Union. This is one of the reasons why the living standards were so good. And that professional class became almost overnight pauperized. It mm -hmm. became, um, there was a, uh, a, a collapse of the kind of professional class where they, right. where they saw their, their, their social positions and their professional positions decline. Um, many people were forced to, um, you know, sell things on the streets or sell things in markets when they had been, you know, lawyers or engineers before. Um, the, the economy went through a very harsh time. At the same time, you had territorial conflict. You had um, a huge rise of paramilitaries. You had uh, the places like Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which were autonomous regions in the Soviet period, became sort of ungoverned or there was a con they were contested. Ajara, which was also an autonomous region in the Soviet period, um, became almost became independent until 2004, and then it was reintegrated into Georgia, essentially. So they were facing tons and tons of problems. We have discussions about Georgia pivoting away from its European path, whatever that means. Um, so how can you see this, in this election impact the future of... Uh... Well, I think that the idea... There's a lot going on, right? The world is going through huge transformations, and I think the Georgian government is trying to um, adapt to uh, rapidly changing conditions. You know, for example, the EU is in a very big crisis. There's been a war in Ukraine after Russia invaded Ukraine. I think that really scared and um, the Georgian dream government, and they instead of aligning with this geopolitical um, posture of the EU, NATO, and the United States in relation to to Russia and in relation to China, they've basically asserted what I call functional neutrality, where instead of trying to be aligned with this geopolitical mobilization, they've said, look, we're going to um, basically not take a side in the war. And this has been beneficial to the Georgian um, state and to the society on, on a number of levels because they've been able to get political and economic concessions from Russia, which they have no mm -hmm. formal relations with, right, since right. Uh, 2008. Yeah. Um, and they also have been signed a you know strategic partnership agreement with China because the South Caucasus has become much more important for transit routes. Right. The because so it, yeah, right to go through on because the South Caucasus was not part of this Chinese Belt yeah. and Road Initiative at first, but now it's become very important as a way to get goods from China to the European Union. India is trying to build um, uh, corridors through Azerbaijan and maybe through Armenia and Georgia to go to Russia and to the Black Sea to, to, to ship to Europe as well. Yep. Um, so you're seeing this way in which the South Caucasus is becoming um, much more valuable to more actors. At the same time, the West is in a, I wouldn't call it necessarily terminal, but I would say they're in a huge crisis of like legitimacy and also internally very fractured while still united geopolitically in this way. And it's creating a situation in the South Caucasus where the states don't have the security or economic luxury to be able to say, we're gonna align with that West, right? And especially considering Georgia has no border with any EU country. Uh, it does have a border with a NATO country being Turkey, but it's in some way very isolated from the rest of its potential allies well, if it was to join any form of alliance. Well, also think about it like this. I mean, Turkey is in NATO. 
But Turkey's position on the war has actually been Quite ambiguous. Is actually been one much more similar to the Georgian state. So the Georgian government has aligned not against the West. This is important. Georgia is not aligned against the West. Georgia is aligning with actors inside of the West that have a different position than, say, Brussels or Washington D.C. Hungary, Turkey. Right, Hungary, Turkey, Slovakia are the most famous, are the most well-known ones. But in some sense, there are there are forces inside of Germany and Spain and France, France and other yeah. countries, right? Some on the left, some on the right, which are also questioning whether or not the geopolitical posture of the West mm -hmm. is going to be the best and long-term guarantee of security, stability. For their own countries. For their own countries, right? Yeah. So the Georgian government has actually taken that position. And this is why I say functional neutrality, right? They're not opposing the West. It's very similar to how um, uh, uh, a lot of countries are talking, right? Yep. So um, it's not... Um, even if you look at how uh, this BRICS uh, conference is happening, right? Right now. They're, they're talking about BRICS not as being, not that I think Georgia's going to join BRICS necessarily, but I'm saying like the way that they're talking is saying like, look, there are these problems of geopolitical tensions that the West is exacerbating, and it's affecting the ability to have uh, deeper economic mm -hmm. ties from these new, what I call, nodes of accumulation, right? In what in nodes of accumulation being sites or countries and places that are new um, uh, places where um, money is flowing from. It's not just coming from the West is no longer the only economic game in town, right? So countries like Georgia are trying to balance that. The problem is that during the Saakashvili period and after, and even during the first years of Georgian Dream, uh, really they deepened ties with the West in such a way where they built this idea of Georgia as being Georgia can only exist if it's part of, the, of it, if it's integrated with the West. But the problem is, is that they needed to protect certain aspects of the national interest and still try to join the West while this war is happening. And that is creating a lot of tensions in the country. This discussion with Brian Gigantino shed light on the many reasons why a party like Georgian Dream can garner significant support within Georgia. It was also particularly interesting to observe how the policies of Saakashvili have created a rift between the opposition and working class people. We have noticed strong support for Georgian Dream in regions neglected by Saakashvili and his peers. Areas where people feel left behind while neoliberals have enriched themselves, at the expense of a decaying public sector and a struggling working class communities. The opposition has dismissed any support for Georgian Dream as support for Russia, which does a disservice to those who do not identify with the values of other political parties that have long exploited them. After my interview with Brian Gigantino, I spoke with Becca Natsvilishvili, a professor of political economy and globalization, a labor organizer, and a former MP in the Georgian parliament. Although he ran on the Georgian Dream slate, he is a member of the Social Democrats for Georgia. He also served as the former vice chair of the Committee for European Integration. During his time in parliament, he worked closely on pension reforms, but left the Georgian Dream coalition in 2019, sitting as an independent MP until 2020. Georgian Dream is a technocratic government, you know, like in all post-Soviet countries, even the countries which are in European Union now. That's why it's a poorly technocratic government, which is, which is a mixture between, uh, you know, uh, some kind of paternalistic conservatism and neoliberalism. We've seen that the uh, European Union has shown a lot of interest in, this, in, in the elections, and in, as well as meddling through uh, the passing of the foreign agent law. They've mentioned multiple times that uh, Georgia is pivoting away from its uh, European path by adopting such measures. This gap emerged after the war between Russia and Ukraine because Georgian government tried to keep some kind of middle position, neutral position, I would say, but it's, it is not neutral. It is more, I would say, military neutrality as neutrality as general because if you see, for example, the votes in UN and so on, these votes are in favor of Ukraine, in favor of European Union and so on. Uh, that's why we could not say that Georgia was totally neutral, but Georgia uh, tried to avoid any kind of um, interference militarily. Mm -hmm. It means that, for example, if when Georgian government was asked to deliver to Ukraine some arms, some weapons, and so on, they rejected. 
Um, and uh, when Georgian government was asked to, for example, to organize or support sending of warriors to Ukraine, they rejected. They uh, avoided to be involved directly in this process, you know. And that's why I would not say that Georgian government was neutral totally, but militarily they tried to keep themselves away from this process. But I think the Georgian government is not sure that Ukraine-Russian war will end with a with a defeat of Russia. That's why they are careful with Russia because we had already the war with Russia in 2008, and frankly speaking, we did not get any military aid, and nobody has been sanctioned after the war between Russia and Georgia. No, can Russia was have been not sanctioned after that, and somehow, somehow, because Georgia has this experience, Georgian dream maybe become cautious to in be involved in this process directly. What, what's the intention of foreign countries in pushing Georgia and opening a second front? A lot was happening between um, the, the government and some foreign representatives for foreign countries behind the curtain we could not uh, we could not uh, discuss because it was behind the curtain you know uh, that's why what was publicly made it was a statement from Ukrainian government that it was a high time now it was a right time now to get back the breakaway territories, uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia back to Georgia and so on. And it could be only done through military engagement in these two regions. It means that because Russia signed with both these breakaway regions the military uh, uh, agreement, uh, Russia will interfere in Georgia militarily. And that's why there are no evidences that somebody from the West dictator required public evidences from Georgian government to be involved in this law. But the logic how the Ukraine government and representatives, high representatives of Ukraine government made the statements, it means that there was some kind of attempt to do it. But, but, um, of course, I, I don't know if uh, Georgian Dream or in, uh, any other government would make this step, because this step would destroy Georgia. And if you ask the people now, yeah, we are talking about Georgian aspiration in Europe, how Georgian people are approaching Europe and so on. If you ask ordinary people if you want to be part of European Union and so on, yes, of course, they will respond to you that, yes, why not? You know, but, but, if you, we look at the figures, what kind of economic relation, trade and so on, we have in Georgia, we, we, with which countries, we see that even with whole members of European Union, we have less trade than, for example, with Turkey, with China, and with Russia. You know? Mm -hmm. That's why it's, it makes everything clear that we did not manage, and the European Union did not manage to integrate Georgia in his economic space. You know? Because if you don't have trade, if you don't have real tangible relation with European Union, it is just a name, yeah. you know? Okay, the name is quite attractive and so on, but there are no tangible outcomes of this relation. And it was a big mistake of European Union because 2008, 18, 2019, I was approaching the politicians of the European Union ambassadors of different countries of European Union in Georgia that if we, if our goal is to make Georgia better place for life and deter Russia 
it would be good to make some kind of Marshall plan for Caucasus or Marshall plan for, for example, Balkan and Caucasus countries and so on. To bring stability. Yeah, to bring stability, to bring prosperity in full-fledged manner in European Union, mm -hmm. you know? And this did not happen. Only European Union is not able to uh, contribute to Georgian development, you know? European Union is contributing maybe through this conditionality and so on, what European Union's typical tools are, to make some, you know, rules and institutions, to create some rules and institutions for, I don't know, for liberal democracy. But liberal democracy does not mean economic development, you know? These, these two notions are not interlinked with each other. They are countries with liberal democracy with a high inequality and so on. You know, that's why uh, I think that the problem once again is that, you know, at the moment European Union and um, uh, US is trying to impose on Georgia this choice, either West or, you know, East. we will we will have no relation with them. You know, this is quite problematic because geographically, Georgia could not could not develop in different way. And mentally also, Georgia is a part of Western civilization, even contributor to Western civilization, but also to the same time it is a part of Caucasian, also Asian civilization. And somebody, somehow, you know, people are trying to eradicate a part this of Georgian identity. Part of Georgian identity, but they don't realize that this is our wealth. You know? Mm -hmm. And that's why maybe, maybe because we are quite old country with a quite old history, which has a big and quite long experience to deal with the big powers and so on. Right. Maybe we will we will yeah. We will find make right thing and yeah. find the solution for this problem. Becca explained how Georgia navigates its relationship with Russia by avoiding direct hostilities while still voting in line with Western positions at the United Nations. Simultaneously, it balances relations between China and the European Union. Becca refers to this strategy as militant neutrality, noting that Georgian Dream adopted this policy to prevent regional conflict that could negatively impact Georgia. The following day, I took the opportunity to explore Georgia during the polling period of the elections. I recorded footage outside a polling station and didn't encounter any tensions throughout my walk around Tbilisi. After the polls closed, I also documented the vote counting process at another polling station, where media crews and election observers were present, filming the tallying of ballots. I didn't personally observe any irreg irregularities. The night of the elections remained calm and the first results were, were announced around 5 a.m. the next morning showing a clear victory for Georgian Dream. On the morning of October the 27th, 2024, I sat down with Revaz Karanadze, a political economist based in Tbilisi, Georgia. But the results came in um, earlier this morning, and it seems like Georgian Dream has received 54% of the vote, which uh, should translate into a constitution constitutional majority. Uh, how do you interpret the results coming in today? Well, this is the second highest result of Georgian Dream in its electoral history since 2012. They got 54.97% and they got 54.2% around or 54% this time. Well, <clears throat> there was a huge mobilization of the silent majority because the Western countries and the Western media was portraying that liberals who got not more than 10%, each, each party got like only four, five parties crossed the 5% threshold, Georgian Dream, and the second largest party got 10% only. The third party got like 9%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, 
fourth party got 9% and the fifth party got 8 or 7%. So. Therefore, it shows that these European values and this uh, focus on the foreign politics mm -hmm. and foreign policy in general, that is very hostile to Russia and is all about the European Union. Georgians do not want to have a hostile warmongering relations with Russia because we've experienced that West left us alone to fight a war that Ukraine is actually fighting now on much bigger scale, but much smaller scale. We had that in 20, 2008. And what West did was they sent us water to drink. And trust me, there's a plenty of water in Georgia to drink because it was like the mineral water center of mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. Therefore, it's people are very much seeing that if they do not support Georgian dream government, although people might not like it, then they're uh, seeing all the pressure coming from the US, coming from the EU, EU sort of getting this unfair resolution saying that you, we should, uh, if we want to defend democracy, we should um, do everything what they say and we should free Saakashvili from jail, and etc. etc. So people got mobilized, mobilized, and they went and voted for Dream because the Dream is the only power that they think will be stable and would avoid any severe confrontation and military destruction. Uh, of Russia and it's also we are seeing how Ukraine is actually being obliterated and the West is actually Western powers are doing nothing their 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 support is just you know just uh, in debt mm -hmm. more in debt more debts for Ukraine and more money to the Black Rock mm -hmm. the Georgian people are not the people that West thinks they are we, because they think that we are some uh, I don't know inexperienced people but we are a nation of 4,000 years old and we knew how to balance between great powers and the, I'm sorry, but also European Union is thinking that the sheer arrogance towards Georgia that they that they um, show is very much actually backfiring at them. It seems like an observatory uh, collective, uh, election observant, observation collective called My Vote, uh, <laughs> has called this election fraudulent. What do you have to say about this? Because the My Vote, unlike the international observers, actually, the Council of Europe and even the European Union who said there are no violations and one of the German, I'm, I'm shocked, you know, Germans saying that we should have elections like that as an exemplary in Germany because it was so good, because there are always violations someplace. We've seen in the United States, we've seen it in Italy, that there are always brawls and, you know, fights on the election polls, but it was none in Tbilisi, it was like one or two places. But you cannot forge elections and say that 54 to 10 percent is forged because no election violations were found by international observers and my vote are the people that consist of the UNM, the opposition supporters, and they are the NGOs who do not want to register as, uh, foreign, you know, agents. as foreign agents because the Georgian Dream passed a law that if you receive more than 20% of your income as, uh, as an NGO from international organizations or foreign governments, you should register yourself as a foreign agent. I think that's very logical. In every country, including the US, even Jordan has that, right? So if France has much stricter foreign agent laws than Georgia has. Canada's much well. stricter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably. And therefore now these organizations are fighting for their existential survival in their heads. I don't know why, but that's why. And they're going to say these things. We, it was expected. It was expected. But they're shocked because the silent majority that did not come out in the streets and because it's young people and UNM activists who were like marching and saying new flags, it actually means that most of the people actually working in the NGOs still prefer, some of them secretly voted for the Georgian dream because you, because the online space, especially Facebook, is very toxic and it's like a liberal bubble of these NGOs and you are very much bullied if you say something even neutral right. to this law or if you say something even neutral to, to European Union. And therefore many people actually are much more active on TikTok where it's much freer to express yourself, less uh, censorship and um, I was also looking at TikTok, and TikTok was very much anti-opposition, uh, yeah. anti, anti-liberals, and the people in general are very much fed up with this. Uh, you know, you can join the Europe, but our door is always open. So it's with NATO, and like we see, it's a bullshit. And we're not dumb people, and I'm tired of people, especially with these Western experts who don't know anything about, about my region. Yeah. Not just Georgia, anything about Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, or even Turkey and Iran, or Russia, this region, like, you know, Caucasus region, 
or greater Middle East, these people are telling me how to behave. They have no idea who we are. There's, they have no idea how social structure, economic structure is run. They don't know our history. They don't know our cultural, social interactions between each other. And it's kind of like these people telling us how to behave is actually uh, backfiring at them. And that is the biggest, like Euroscepticism in Georgia became more and more popular because of the EU and because of Western powers and yeah. because how they have behaved towards us. And they've been saying, oh, our door is open and they always expect you to be in a waiting room, therefore they can manipulate you better. And there's and a carrot and stick exactly, approach. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And they're gonna, they only remember Georgia when it's about their geopolitical yeah. interests, when it's about their international corporations. and it's Isolating like, Russia. Yeah, yeah. That, um, that's, that's a huge problem and they, they misunderstand how the world works and I think the sheer arrogance of the EU and Europe generally uh, somehow they forget that they are a very declining power. Even the US is and especially Europe. And Georgia, look at the geography where we, where we are. So I'm not going to go too into details but just look at the geography. It's more telling. We have Russia, we have Turkey, we have China and people saying that we need to become an economic hub, like transportation hub. And the opposition guy comes around, this uh, guy who was evicting people, he's a leader of the bank, Hazarad Lelo. One of, he's not the UNM, but he's like, uh, he's a number, his, his party is called Lelo. He was saying that we need to avoid, we need to um, kick the Chinese out and bring in only Western investments. That means, and the, it's like, how are you gonna only you have Western investments in Georgia when you have Turkey and other countries that are much have much better infrastructure and kick out the only viable mm -hmm. interest that can actually really make the hub. I don't believe in that, but even it's against their logic, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of stupid. If you're into finances, if you're into business, if you're a right wing capitalist, it doesn't make sense. I was reading as well that the opposition has is considering not recognizing the vote, or oh, they obviously do not recognize the results, but what could that translate into? Nothing. We, nothing. Because every elections, every elections it's the same thing the last elections they got 30 they got around 40 percent these elections all the four opposition parties that crossed the threshold got 37 and there are five parties and they have 37 percent the largest party got 10 percent unm is totally destroyed and unm is now the third largest party it's not even the second largest party anymore it's like sure party I mean, they always say that, but after, like, Georgian Dream does not even need to start a parliamentary session now because they got so much votes. And it's a proportional party list representation. It's not like in US, Canada, and UK when you have, like, single member constituencies and, like, first past the post, you know. It's, it's very much proportional representation. Right. And winning proportional representation is a huge thing. And, like, observers saying there's no huge violations and there are no violations at all, some of them. It means it's, legit, it's legitimized by Georgian people and Georgian dream is now seeking less and less the approval of international, not international, Western, because international is a huge thing to well, say. That's Western organizations, you know? Because we could argue that the West um, lost its leverage over the Georgian people exactly. and created massive distrust. Exactly. exactly. It's an, it's a, we are in the distrust of the West and Georgian dream has no more legitimacy to actually be freer against the West and take more actions because Georgian Dream could have said and the, the billionaire Devanishwili really could have said, you know, forget it. I'm gonna go with the West. We can negotiate something. We can no no. They tried, but the West was very adamant. They thought we were some, I don't know. Okay. The, one of the Western leaders, Devanish really said, he didn't name the name, he's told our Prime Minister that Georgia should open the second front in twenty twenty two when the Ukraine war started. <clears throat> And our Prime Minister asked this guy, how many days do you think Georgia would last? He answered three or four days, but near three million you'd survive. So they think us that we are just a raw meat who could be used to show how we we were, you know, <clears throat> they could like ethnically destroy us, but then they were going to say, oh, Russians are the bad guys. So mm -hmm. we're going to be just used because they're fighting for the, to, until the last Ukrainian. But we have more experience and this is not Ukraine here. You know, this is Caucasus. We have a different experience, different history, different culture. We're not Ukraine. We're not Moldova. We're not any other country that was manipulated. We've already been manipulated between 2023 and 2012. Mm -hmm. And 2008 war is a really example, is a good example of that. And we saw that there's, there's huge, a lot of footages 
of locals in uh, South Ossetia, Srimala region, when they were saying, if you know there were war was going to start, why didn't you evacuate us? Because one woman was saying, mm. you, I had to choose between my father and my son, and I chose my son. And I, she was crying, may the God forgive me. And she said, you were worse than Russians. You know why? Because you wanted to do a genocide against Georgians just to show the world and the West how bad the Russians were. Mm. And that narrative is very much mm -hmm. alive, especially among the people who are older. And this is, these were, the West does not understand the heartbeat and the pulse of our everyday life. Yeah. They don't understand that we're not stupid. And I'm so tired of them looking down on us as some stupid people mm -hmm. or whatever. They were very wrong and their time is over. And uh, if the door is closed to the EU, where do you think uh, Georgia will be able to find some level of political support or economic support from? Georgia needs to think of development of its own, on its own, and find multi... You don't need to become part of some, I don't know, intra-state organization like EU. EU was like, you know, objective. But, but Georgia never had, none of the Georgian governments ever had like the, a plan how to develop. They were like, oh, we'll go in the European Union and everything's going to be fine. We know that the example of Bulgaria, for example, it's been in use since 2017, 2007, excuse me. And, you know, nothing changed much. People are still migrating to Western Europe. Actually, there's a drain, brain drain of population of exactly. Bulgarians going to Germany. Exactly. So Georgia sits on a crossroads of, you know, in, in the middle of Eurasia, more or less. So there are many options. Many options in the world is opening up many options around us. And we should be smart about it. And we should have a strategy and a vision of our own development. If we don't have it and we are thinking that someone, mm -hmm. some good uncle or, uncle or auntie will come and help us develop, that's, I think, irrational. Yeah. And, and that should end. And I think that is the biggest reason of the self-colonizing mentality that we had and that the comprador class had for the last 30 years. And we, we, we we're currently seeing the rise of BRICS, right? Um, and within BRICS, you also have countries that have tensions between them, right? There's uh, India and China that have border disputes. You have Saudi Arabia and Iran who have had political uh, Saudi disagreements. Saudi Arabia did not really join. Yet. Oh, they haven't joined yet, but the, uh, sorry, the United Arab Emirates have. Mm -hmm. um, and additionally, we note that Russia and Georgia have some level of disagreements, especially when it comes to territorial integrity. Yes, and uh, there's no political collaboration, uh, from what I understand. Um, do you see a possibility of Georgia joining BRICS? This, I mean, considering it's an organization that could look beyond these types of uh, because, disagreements. No, I don't actually, because considering the given situation, if Turkey joins or Azerbaijan joins or Armenia joins, that's a different story. However, the thing is that India's 20% is not occupied by China or Chinese 20% is not occupied by India. That's a uh, Disputes that are like border disputes and some regional disputes that are on a smaller scale. But for Georgia, that's a huge thing. And we have 300,000 refugees within the country, internal displaced people, mm -hmm. IDPs. So somehow Georgia and Russia need to settle down this conflict, not to have ethnic tensions between Georgians and the people that live in uh, the so-called occupied uh, territories. territories. And that's very important. Until that settles, I think there might be some level of economic cooperation that's still going with Russia, but political cooperation will be very difficult because even the Georgian Dream supporters might be very, very angry on that or dissatisfied. And to be honest, there's no like Russian influence here in this country. There's no, we just don't, we just want to have uh, neighborly relations and like normal relations with Russia and no conflict with Russia. But to say that there's a huge love for them or trying to find the ways to cooperate on political level now. And do you feel like uh, with the mandate that Georgian Dream was given, do you think that there could be space to settle the South Ossetia and Abkhazia conflicts once and for all? I don't know. I don't know. It's too is, 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 it, is it a top priority for Georgian Dream? No. No. It's one of the priorities. And I think there is more space with Georgian Dream than it is with the liberal opposition and the UNM and the far-right fascists of Saakashvili. But, yeah, there's more space comparatively, but I don't think that will be resolved in like near future. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, maybe it will, but I, from my observation, no. 
Reva's analysis highlighted the weakness of opposition parties and the lack of substance in their policies. The Georgian people clearly do not want to entertain even the slightest possibility of opening a second front against Russia on behalf of the West. They see through European arrogance and refuse to allow the European Union to dictate who can and cannot govern Georgia. Following my interview with Rivas, opposition members began releasing statements, urging the West not to recognize the election results and demanding a new vote under international supervision, completely blindsiding the Central Election Commission of Georgia. On October the 30th, the CEC issued a notice detailing the excessive pressure the organization faced throughout the election process, reporting instances of threats and abuse. Although the notice did not specify the source of these threats, opposition parties have publicly refused to accept the election results. On October 28, 2024, I spoke with Sopo Japaritse, a labor organizer in the health sector and co-host of the podcast Reimagining Soviet Georgia, about the election results and the opposition's party stands towards them. I do believe most of the Georgians who voted for Georgian Dream and people like me who don't vote and didn't vote for Georgian Dream uh, would be willing to defend our country from any kind of uh, coup or any kind of external influence. Um, but this is the problem with this is that this will lead to kind of a civil war. That's what we all want to avoid. So any kind of showing of force might trigger some kind of conflict. When you have so many people, you cannot take everyone's actions into account. There's just no way. Um, and so this is actually what we do want to avoid is a civil war. It doesn't need to be a civil war in this country. There's absolutely no reason for it. Um, this is just very artificially created narratives. Um, that have become powerful forces that are um, making the making George, current situation in Georgia like a zero sum game, and it's very dangerous for no reason to go through another civil war and kind of conflict. It's been thirty years of this. You know, everyone is very tired. They really do want stability and, and growth and sort of prosperity at this point. And um, <coughs> what do you expect? will happen today at 7 p.m.? Ken, I don't know. I think probably large-scale protest. I really hope there's no attempt. Sometimes there's like attempts to go into the parliament, to overtake the parliament, and this is actually where a lot of the violence and the poli police um, <clears throat> occur, is uh, when people try to break into the parliament and the police defend the parliament can use like you know water cannons tear gas and and so on and this is if there's no like direct like intervention of trying to break into parliament which i hope there will not be because that seems to be where most of the violence comes from we'll see i mean that could escalate a lot of things again um it's very difficult um to you know fully have um, faith that everything will go smoothly and nobody will make a mistake, neither the opposition nor the police nor the government. You know, it's, it's, it's when you put everything in an existential crisis, everyone's motivated to go above and beyond. And I do think that um, the EU and the US and all the politicians, these reckless politicians, um, making these kinds of sweeping remarks in support of the protesters and opposition fuel the righteousness and they, the, of protesters. They believe that everyone's on their side. Uh, and they're not against a U.S. or EU sort of intervention, like even like mm -hmm. intervention, even if it was like a physical intervention. So they are being told that the, the good side, EU, you know, the West is um, on their side. And they, the West wants them to succeed. And so we even had like members of parliament and government from other countries come and speak at our protests. Like that's very much kind of Ukraine style. And and so this is this is giving people false um, false support uh, and also giving them a blank check, green light to act any way possible because they're told that this is a fight for Georgia's sovereignty against Russian takeover, which is absolutely natural. How is this election so much in the European Union's interests? I mean, it's not even an EU state. Um, the candidate status, I believe, was put on was, was frozen in December. 
So uh, I'm just curious, what could explain the presence of, I mean, he, he mentioned that he was part of a delegation of European uh, uh, members of European Parliament. What could explain that much investment on the, the political investment yeah. that we have? <clears throat> That's because of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, this has happened that that has made everything geopolitical. And now they are much more desperate into holding on to Georgia as a sort of Western, you know, uh, country that will that will be um, in favor of, you know, in follow along EU and U.S. paths. So the only reason he, Georgia was even given a candidate status in the beginning before they froze it, of course, was because of the war. Otherwise, we would have not gotten it because it was like Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine. And this is why they want to, this is why they think that it's such an important place uh, because otherwise... <clears throat> will fall, they think, will fall to Russia. And it's just not true because Georgian politics is actually pro-Western. They're just this current government, since they saw in the last two years, is that they need to be much more careful because there's <coughs> wars everywhere around us. Middle East, um, there's Ukraine. And so they have attempted to be more pragmatic and, um, you know, not be so unequivocally following everything the EU does when they're not part of the EU, you know? So they so they are not complying with all of the sanctions. They're complying with some sanctions against Russia. And they're trying to take advantage of their positions. So Georgia has a position. And actually a lot of Western countries are using Georgia to export things into Russia and so on. And so they're trying to use this advantage to economically grow the country. Um, and they're playing it, you know, they, they are open for business. They're very pragmatic business people, the the um, Georgian dream. This is how they think of themselves and this is how they act. They're not like uh, pigeonholed into ideology. Now, the president of Georgia, she's a Cold War warrior. I mean, she's comes from that school, you know, huge anti-communist. Like, she doesn't care about pragmatism or business. She's a French diplomat who is very much tied to the Cold War mentality and rhetoric. Um, and she wants just pro-EU. The same night of this interview, the opposition held a rally in front of the parliament. The protest took place right at the main entrance of the parliament. In Canada, such an action would result in bank accounts being frozen almost immediately. During the protest, the police stayed away from the parliament building, only guarding the door used by parliamentary staff. I have witnessed many anti-government protests in Georgia, and the protest held on October 28th was relatively small compared to the Sakashvili protest in 2021 or the foreign agent law protests. This may suggest some weakness on the opposition's part in mobilizing public support. And during the rally, I observed American flags and patches of the Georgian Legion, a unit within the Ukrainian army primarily composed of Georgian fighters. The Georgian Legion takes its name from the 1941-1945 Georgian Legion, which operated under the control of the Waffen SS. With the opposition and president still refusing to recognize the election results, the governing Georgian Dream Party must tread carefully in its dealings with Western governments, which have expressed hostility towards the outcome. It will also need to manage pressure from the opposition. As some of my interviewees point, have pointed out, it is not uncommon for opposition parties in Georgia to reject election results. For the sake of the Georgian people, we can only hope the country maintains stability and avoids another Maidan-like upheaval. This was Rami reporting for Reason to Resist in Tbilisi, Georgia.